the area below will, within the next two years, be the 10th largest city in the state of Pennsylvania. A busy community of 70,000 people living in a city which was completely planned before the first house was built. Let's rewind for a second. There may be no more iconic view of the suburbs than this one, of Levittown, Pennsylvania in 1958. What once represented progress, today represents just about everything wrong with the suburbs. The question is, can they be fixed? If we're gonna talk about the suburbs, why not go straight to the source? And the source in this case is Levittown. There are actually three Levitt towns, and I'm in the one here in Pennsylvania. I gotta say, I'm super excited to be here because I've only read about Levitt towns in books, so it's really cool to walk around. And if you do walk around, you'll notice that it's actually just a pretty ordinary suburb, which makes it great for talking about suburbs generally. But Levitt towns have a fascinating history, so let's buckle up for story time for a second. Levitt towns solved a major problem. Not enough housing had been built during the Great Depression and during World War II. After the war, GIs got married and wanted to move out of their parents' houses and start a family. They wanted the American dream. A house, a green lawn, modern appliances, and most importantly, a modern home that reflected the social values of the time. Prior to Levitt Towns, most of the families that lived in American suburbs were wealthy. But now, even factory workers could afford to buy their own home with a yard. They could afford these new houses because Levitt and Sons used an efficient assembly line technique for building houses, something that hadn't been done at this scale before. The process had 27 steps that allowed a house to be built within a day. This is why so many Levitt houses are the same. They prioritized low cost and efficiency over design and customization. Each construction worker had a single task they would complete on each house, so they all became really good at one task. At their peak, Levitt and Sons finished construction of a new house every 16 minutes. In their first Levitt town on Long Island, they built 17,447 single family houses. At the time, it was the largest undertaking of its kind by a single developer in the U.S., and the public was impressed by how fast and efficient Levitt houses were built. The land for Levittown, Pennsylvania, where I am, was purchased in 1951 from broccoli and spinach farmers. Construction began in 1952, and all its 17,311 homes were completed in just six years. All of these homes are one of six single-family models, and different models were grouped in specific neighborhoods, which in turn sorted residents by income level. Levitt towns were also famously segregated by race. William Levitt, president of Levitt and Sons, proclaimed, we can solve the housing problem or we can solve the racial problem, but we cannot combine the two. In the standard lease for all the first residents of Levitt town, clause 25 stated that, the tenant agrees not to permit the premises to be sued or occupied by any person other than members of the Caucasian race. At first, this practice was legal, but even after it was deemed unconstitutional, the Levitts would continue to reject black homebuyers again and again. Eventually, the Myers, a black family, bought a Levittown, Pennsylvania house in 1957, making history as the first black family to move into a Levitt suburb. Riots of hundreds of violent people ensued, which caused months of harassment and damage to the family's property. Now, the overall land use mix was almost as homogenous as the residents themselves. Levitt and Sons set aside land for some community amenities, like a pool, shopping center, religious buildings, schools, parks, and sports areas. Levittown's biggest impact might be its influence on subsequent suburbs, which adopted the same mass-produced building techniques and overall bland sameness. Okay, so that's the story of Levittown, and I'm gonna use Levittown as an example in this video quite a lot, but let's get down to it. What are the problems of the suburbs that need to get fixed? Well, here's a list. First, their low density. This kind of space was seen as a good thing back in the Levittown days, and certainly before. Prior to the car and the streetcar suburbs, people had to live within walking distance to work, resulting in overcrowded conditions. The idea of a house with a yard and fresh air sounded like paradise. It's still the American dream for many today. Second, they're single use, homes only. Most residential developers are just that, residential developers. They specialize and adding shopping, coffee shops, and offices to a neighborhood design and then renting those spaces or selling them is outside of their business model. Much easier just to bulldoze a large area and put up the same home over and over again and market them all to a specific demographic and income group. Third. They're car-oriented. Again, this was not seen as a bad thing initially, and many don't consider it a bad thing now, but cars contribute to air pollution, road deaths, obesity, and traffic. The suburbs make it so you basically have to own a car to live there, which can exclude people who can't afford a car or can't drive one due to disability. Fourth, they tend to segregate people. I already talked about this as it relates to Levitt towns, but the suburbs today are still segregated, particularly at the level of the neighborhood. Finally, they're bland and cookie cutter. Levittown laid out a model for suburban development that relies on economies of scale to produce low-cost housing at a profit. It doesn't matter that the neighborhood is bland. 
Now that we've talked about problems, we can start talking about solutions. That's the best part. The nice thing is that there are policy solutions to just about every problem I've mentioned, and a few of them are on display here in Levittown. So let's get into it after the bike bell. I'm gonna give On Location Dave a break for a second as I had a pretty bad cold back then and it was very difficult for me to talk to camera. So in studio Dave is gonna take it from here. And while I have you, I wanted to point out that this video is all about fixing existing suburbs and not so much about designing new ones, though some of the same lessons may apply. Okay, if we're going to increase density in the existing suburbs, some building will need to occur. The difference is that it'll be through accessory dwelling unit construction, suburban infill, and demolitions and replacements. But before any of that can occur, suburbs need to have the legal framework to allow it. Luckily, new policies are being adopted by cities and states that allow as many as four to six units on suburban lots. Now, this isn't happening everywhere, but could be coming to a suburb near you. This is a key aspect of zoning reform, changing the local law to allow for more units. Out of curiosity, what's the zoning like in Levittown? Well, Levittown isn't a city itself and spans multiple jurisdictions. The largest is Bristol Township, and most of Levittown is actually zoned R3. That allows for row houses, duplexes, and even small apartment buildings. But when I visited, I didn't notice any of that at all. The zoning code says that the maximum allowable density is five dwelling units per acre, or five homes per acre. That means that if you had an apartment building of five units, it would have to be on a one acre a lot. Not super practical. The devil is in the details when it comes to zoning. This type of housing, often called missing middle housing, would be great to add to a place like Levittown. They can be more affordable than what's out there today and provide additional income to the property owner. Adding density like this can add challenges, and one of the most cited is parking. Where will all of these new residents park? Will someone adding an ADU have to add a parking space as well? That adds to the overall cost of housing. Most neighborhoods like Levittown still have excess capacity for cars on the street and likely in driveways as well. Parking could become scarce if every house became a fourplex, but that's unlikely. And if that were the case, the neighborhood's overall density would allow for mass transit to be a more viable alternative for all of those new residents. Residential density is great, but what about other uses? The suburbs are all about the segregation of land uses. Housing here, businesses there, industry way over there. This is a problem because it increases traffic and emissions. It's also just really time consuming to hop in your car and drive 20 minutes to get your regular Pokemon booster pack, as we all do. What if those cars were at the corner store or right below you? Much more convenient. The same is true for neighborhood friendly businesses like coffee shops, ice cream parlors, hair salons, and any other business with a local draw that doesn't require a target sized footprint. I have a whole video on this particular topic you can check out if you want to learn more about corner stores in the suburbs. Mixed use can work great in the other direction too. Cities can encourage new housing development to be added to existing commercial zones in the suburbs. And here in California, the state has stepped up to ensure that local governments can do exactly this. Through Senate Bill 6 and Assembly Bill 2011, California now allows developers to build housing on commercially zoned land by right, with an expedited permit process if a certain percentage of the residential units are affordable housing. Local governments don't want this as they get more tax revenue from commercial uses than residential uses. So they'd rather a commercial use just sit vacant than filling it with residential or mixed uses. Previously existing malls and strip malls can also be retrofitted to better fit current needs by converting stores into housing, promoting infill development in parking spaces, or reusing the land for entirely new developments. Tiny Tim Plaza in Santa Ana, California did just this. Previously it was a small strip mall with a parking lot and gas station but the new landowner got the property rezoned and replaced the gas station with 51 affordable housing units and refreshed the existing storefronts to ensure ongoing business health for the community. The site is within walking distance to two planned stations of the Orange County Light Rail Line set to open next year, so the residents of those apartments will have even more options for using public transit instead of cars. It's unfortunate that Levittown never received this mixed-use makeover. In 1955, Levitt and Sons built Shopo Rama an L-shaped mall located at the edge of town to attract shoppers from nearby residential areas. At the time, it was the largest pedestrian mall east of Mississippi. While impressive, the mall turned out to be a bit illogical for its desired use. It filled the desire to stroll while shopping, something typical of denser mixed-use areas, and yet the pedestrian mall was located in the middle of an enormous 6,000-car parking lot and was mainly accessible by a 5-10 to 10 minute drive. While Shepo-Rama was initially loved by Levittown residents, it fell into a state of disuse and disrepair by the early 2000s, and was demolished to make way for a typical looking power center in 2003. The large parking lot still remains, and this newer commercial center is now even less walkable than its predecessor. No mixed use here. Suburbs are car oriented. They're a seemingly endless expanse of wide, fast roads lined with fast food restaurants, big box stores, and strip malls. 
If you turn off those roads, you're in a labyrinth of loops and cul-de-sacs, ironically designed to minimize the noise and safety impact of cars on the houses along them. Getting anywhere in the suburbs on foot or on a bike can be inconvenient at best and dangerous at worst. The good news is that all of those roads, roads outside of homeowners associations and outside of state highway use, are owned and operated by local governments. Reconfiguring roadways to accommodate pedestrians, cyclists, and mass transit takes funding and political will. That's a challenge, but it doesn't rely on the private market like building new ADUs. How could you redesign suburban streets to be better for all modes? Let's start with the worst offenders, the arterial streets. They divide neighborhoods and move traffic at high speeds. They're also quite wide, which could be an asset. Three lanes in each direction could become two lanes in each direction for cars, with a dedicated bus lane or light rail line running in the center. They could become multi-way boulevards that allow for local traffic on the edge and high-speed traffic in the center. I have yet another video on that topic if you're curious about those. The city could also reconfigure the pedestrian space or add pedestrian space to create two-way shared-use paths along the road, giving active transportation users a high-quality, dedicated space to travel. These only work when intersections along the route are reconfigured for safe crossings, and ideally when driveways are consolidated to reduce conflict points with vehicles. New transportation corridors could also be constructed along abandoned rail lines through Rails to Trails initiatives. And some wildlife corridors, like along creeks, could become linear parks that support a shared youth path. The goal is to reconnect those separate uses, so someone could say ride a bike to Target to get those Pokemon cards until a shop opens down the block. And if a suburban community takes the other advice talked about in this video and becomes more dense, then transit could be an option in the suburbs, particularly transit-oriented development. Earlier, I mentioned how racism profoundly affected who was initially allowed to be a homeowner in Levittown. While the Levitts couldn't control who the home would be sold to next, their prejudice carried through to subsequent home sellers and the community as a whole. In 1970, less than 2% of Levittown's population were black, even though only 20 miles away in Philadelphia, the population was around 18% black. By 2000, very little had changed. Only 2.4% of Levittown's residents were black, 1% were Asian, 2.2% were Latino, and 1.2% were mixed race. And that means the remaining 94.4% were white. Clearly, segregation is not going to be solved in a YouTube video, and it gets more complicated when you consider that residents are also segregated by income. As developers build subdivisions with the same house over and over again at the same price point, and the next neighborhood over build another unit with a different price point over and over again. So what then can be done to dismantle suburban segregation? Since the introduction of Levittown-style suburbs, several U.S. laws have helped reduce racism in home sales. The 1968 Fair Housing Act prohibited discrimination about the sale, rental, and financing of residences based on race, religion, national origin, sex, and, as later amended, handicap and family status. This act legally ended the types of discriminatory practices used by the Levitts, but many institutionalized barriers still exist. So the playing field isn't quite level yet. Luckily, the suburbs are becoming increasingly more diverse anyway. Today, over half of black families in America live in the suburbs. Enforcement of the Fair Housing Act is spotty, though, so discrimination still occurs. Mixing income in the suburbs can be just as difficult, particularly with HOAs limiting change in established neighborhoods. Luckily, laws allowing ADUs, for example, can apply to those communities. ADUs are typically more affordable than the houses they are next to, which adds some element of income diversity. Now, one thing Levittown and many suburbs don't have is visual diversity. They have that cookie-cutter look. Now, I know we just talked about segregation, which is a real serious topic, and visual diversity is not nearly as important, but people call the suburbs boring and soulless, and I think there's something to that. We as humans like to look at different and interesting things. That's part of what makes cities so great and exciting. So how can we add visual diversity to a place where the same house has been repeated over and over again? Well, it's called the passage of time. Newly planted trees mature into the leafy streets you see today, which can make it a lot harder to tell that the houses are all similar models. The houses themselves change too. In Levittown, the original designs were pretty efficient, meaning small, and many homeowners built additions. They also painted their houses different colors, landscaped their lawns differently, and made other changes. It's not a miracle cure, and Levittown is still kind of boring, but you don't have the uniformity you see in the old newsreels. This only occurred because there was no rule restricting such change. In communities with powerful homeowners associations, this kind of change may not be possible. Now, no homeowner association is powerful enough to stop trees from growing, but they can absolutely enforce cookie-cutter sameness for the houses and landscaping. Now, obviously, some people like the sameness, 
but I think locking a place in like that robs it of what makes a city so great, the ability to grow and change and reinvent itself over time. Are suburbs a lost cause? I don't think so, but it's gonna take a long time to make them more diverse, dense, sustainable, and interesting. Obviously, building great places initially is a lot better than trying to fix existing places, which is why you're probably gonna love my next video, all about how we can build European-style cities here in the United States. You know the kind with narrow streets, charming buildings, and no cars. It might seem impossible, but I look at examples that exist right now. You have to wait a few weeks to see that on YouTube, but you could just watch it right now over on Nebula. It's live there. Nebula is a creator-owned streaming service that I'm extremely proud to be a part of. On Nebula, you can see all of my extra content, including my great city series, Planning Ancient Rome, and a whole bunch of smaller bonus video content. But me and all my creator friends have started this new thing called Nebula First. Thanks to all the people who subscribe to Nebula, I can produce my content earlier and faster. That means anytime you see a new video posted here on YouTube, the next City Beautiful video is already posted live on Nebula. Other creators are doing the same thing, meaning that you can watch videos from Johnny Harris, Legal Eagle, Jetlag, and more earlier than you find them on YouTube. Now, Nebula is normally priced at a completely reasonable $50 per year, but if you use my code CityBeautiful when you sign in, you get $20 off that annual plan. That brings it down to $2.50 per month, which is really the best deal in streaming for what you get. And if I can just say for a second that signing up for Nebula is probably the best way to support this channel and all the dozens of other creators working to make Nebula a success. And we really are working hard to make Nebula a success. This Nebula first thing is just one new feature we're rolling out to try to add value for our existing subscribers. We just want this product to be great for you and for us and for everyone. So go click on the link on screen or in the description and get $20 off an annual subscription to Nebula and go watch my next video. It's there right now.